I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Xi Yin. Uh, she got his PhD at Harvard University in 2006. And he was a junior fellow at Harvard Society of Fellows and a visiting member at the Institute for Advanced Study. He joined Harvard faculty in uh, 2008 and now a professor of physics. Uh, she received a lot of awards, include um, the NSF Career Awards, uh, Sloan Research Fellowship, and the New Horizon uh, Physics Prize. He is also a Simons investigator and a principal investigator of the Simons Bootstrap collaboration. And today is the first lecture of a series of four lectures by C on uh, uh, 2D string theory. Uh, let's work and see. Well, uh, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, I didn't realize that, that I was uh, subject to such a formal introduction. Um, <laughs> I hope the lecture will be as informal as possible, which is the style I prefer. Um, and uh, also, uh, unfortunately, I would be, wouldn't be able to attend the gun show because of the time zone difference. Um, so uh, the plan uh, is the following. So for the four lectures, roughly speaking, I'm going to hopefully discuss um, the worksheet formulation of 2D string theory um, in the first lecture. In the second lecture, I'll discuss um, the dual matrix quantum mechanics. Um, in the third lecture, I'll discuss the instant uh, which will have a little bit overlap, at least conceptually, uh, with Ashok Sen's lectures. And the fourth, fourth lecture, I'll discuss um, the issues of long strings, uh, the so-called Nansen effect of the matrix model, uh, and black holes in, in, in the context of 2D string theory. Um, so <clears throat> uh, uh, let me begin by uh, describing uh, the motivation for investigating the subject of 2D string theory. Um, now, um, most of the what these lectures are going to be about is something uh, called um, C equals 1 string theory. Um, I'm going to describe what it is um, in a moment. Uh, now, uh, it's going to be a, a kind of bosonic string of living two-dimensional space-time. Um, first of all, the you know, usual textbooks uh, on string theory will introduce, uh, you know, a string theory um, starting from Polyakov action, uh, you know, fixing conformal gauge, introducing the BC ghosts, and do BRT quantization. Um, uh, now, uh, this approach leads one to conclude um, that uh, to formulate, you know, bosonic string the level of perturbation theory, um, you need um, so for bosonic string, uh, you need a, the following ingredients. You have the worksheet CFT, uh, which is a uh, um, uh, C equals 26 called matter CFT uh, together with the BC ghosts. The total center charge will be zero. Um, that would allow for the possibility of having a new potent BRC charge Q, um, uh, its defining property is that Q acting on the B goes will give you the stress energy tensor. Uh, so in that sense, the stress energy tensor is BRT trivial and uh, that effectively gauges um, the worksheet gravity. Um, okay, and then one goes on and to talk about asymptotic string states and S matrix. Um, so the asymptotic states uh, asymptotic uh, string states um, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the BRSD cohomology, um, and they can be represented by vertex operators of the form CC tilde ghosts times some matter vertex operator uh, that is a uh, weight one comma one uh, primary operator with respect to the Virasoro algebra. Um, the usual no goes uh, well. The usual formulation of BRT cohomology in this uh, so-called old covariant quantization uh, language. Um, and finally, we have a uh, the point of this you know string perturbation theory is that it allows us to compute uh, formulate perturbative space-time S matrix. Um, I mean, this S matrix is usually as, as always of the form some um, sum over clusters, uh, with each of which are products of uh, connected amplitudes. And um, each kinetic amplitude uh, is going to be given by some formal uh, expansion in genus and integration over the moduli space of genus G uh, punctured surfaces. I'm being schematic here. You have some insertion of 
the vertex operator in the CFT and some insertion of the um, counter integral of the B ghost that captures the measure on the moduli space. So that's the, uh, schematically the general structure of string perturbation theory. Um, now, uh, if you actually go and, uh, well, so uh, it's usually stated that, uh, you know, to have the matter CFT being uh, one of center charge 26, and if you want to describe strings propagating in Mikowski in space time, uh, you are led to uh, talking about the so called critical bosonic string theory in 26 dimensions. Um, but that theory, it does not make sense at the quantum level. Uh, it does not make sense um, at the level of perturbation theory beyond tree level uh, because it has a tachyon and the tachyons will run in the loops and all the loop diver diagrams will be exponentially divergent. So uh, that's kind of bad. Um, and the, uh, um, the lesson of that is the critical boson string theory simply does not exist as a quantum theory, not even at the level of perturbation theory. Uh, so that's a bit, a bit disappointing. Uh, however, uh, you know, you can kind of evade this uh, trouble by, uh, in principle, by replacing this SQL 26 matter CFT, uh, instead of having 26 free bosons, you can replace it by some other CFT and perhaps uh, getting around this problem of the clustering tachyon. Um, so um, to, uh, to illustrate that, um, uh, well, um, let's say, um, so, you know, at least in a free field construction, you could write V matter um, to be of the form, let's say uh, E to the IKX uh, times some, uh, some kind of oscillator uh, operator made out of you know, derivatives of the, of the, of the fields. Um, and, um, you know, for this operator, you know, you know to represent a, a BRC cohomology, uh, you need the matter part of the vertex operator to be a 1, 1 versus 4 primary. In particular, the weight, uh, which is um, alpha prime over 4 k squared, uh, plus the weight of the this oscillator part, um, uh, needs to add up to 1. Um, so um, now, because k squared is equal to minus uh, the mass squared, um, if you want the theory to be free of tachyon, you want this to be, uh, you know, the next. Uh, minus m squared be non-negative, tachyon free. Uh, so for this purpose, you need uh, this operator, the oscillator part to have uh, uh, weight uh, greater than or equal to one, All right? Um, so um, now uh, that would be a problem uh, with the identity operator, which has weight zero. So you would think that this is kind of um, impossible. Um, um, however, um, you know, this identity operator is not normalizable. So you might imagine um, that uh, the following situation. So suppose we take the matter CFT uh, to be uh, the time like free boson. So we'd like to have a time, we'd like to have a string theory with a space time interpretation, uh, but the space will be replaced by some, um, but by the way, you know, anyone have questions, feel free to just speak up and interrupt me. Uh, right. um, the, uh, the remaining part of the CFT is some, uh, let's say, spatial uh, parts of the Warshi CFT. Uh, as we said, this, you know, if the Warshi CFT takes this form, decoupled system of the time like boson X naught and the rest, the rest must have sequel 25, and uh, it must not con contain a, a relevant operator, no relevant operator, because we want to have a weight, uh, holomorphic, anti holomorphic weight, weight to be, you know, H tilde also. Uh, greater than or equal to one. Um, so uh, do such theories exist? In fact, um, the, only, uh, the only known uh, unitary, uh, the only such uh, unitary uh, CFT is Louisville theory. Okay, so um, so that will be uh, the definition of the so-called sequel one string theory. So the sequel one string theory uh, will be the good old bosonic string theory, following the you know the rules of say Pochinsky uh, textbook. Um, but uh, you need to take the Walsh CFT to be instead of twenty six free bosons, you take it to be uh, this timely boson x naught direct sum with the sequel twenty five Liouville CFT. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, discuss. Um, 
some aspects of the LIBO CFD. Are there any questions? Um, okay, so uh, now uh, as a warm up, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, discuss this, what's so called the linear dilettante theory. Um, I wrote CFT in quotation mark because, uh, as we'll see, um, it's uh, only a CFT in some kind of generalized sense. It doesn't obey some of the axioms we'd like the CFT to obey. Okay. So, um, so we start with, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, X naught and another free boson. Let's say, uh, uh, okay, so we have the Polyakov action that looks like this. And then we have uh, another boson, let's call it phi. Uh, and we add a, a background charge term, which is uh, phi multiplied by uh, the curvature of the worksheet metric multiplied by background charge Q, which is taken to be constant. Um, so this is our worksheet action for the linear Dilton theory. Um, now, um, this, uh, this Q, uh, background charge, it modifies uh, the center charge, uh, which is instead of one plus one from X naught and phi, uh, it is one plus one plus six Q squared. So if you want this to be equal to 26, you need uh, Q to be equal to two. Okay. Um, so uh, now- um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, what about the cosmological constant term? Are you? Uh, I'm going to discuss that. Uh, as, as I said, this is a warm up. I'm not talking about liberal theory yet. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. I mean, this is meant to be pedagogical. Those of you who are familiar with, with liberal theory, I don't know. I mean, if everyone is familiar with, with liberal theory, I can skip this. But, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, just a bit, you know, just for people who are not necessarily familiar with this. Um, okay. Uh, well, in fact, there's a good reason to discuss this because uh, you could wonder why the simplest construction doesn't work. Okay, I guess that's the point of, uh, of this discussion. Right. Um, okay, so if you go to conformal gauge, conformal gauge, um, you know, set, let's say locally, at least JAB to be flat metric eta AB, um, the action uh, looks uh, uh, the same. Uh, as a free boson. Okay, so, um, so you might think that this uh, background charge doesn't really do much, um, but uh, however, however, uh, the dynamics is different. Um, so this simple fact is actually not extremely well known, so I'd like to just say a few words about it. So uh, let's just consider uh, the classical equation of motion for the string. Oh, uh, by the way, I, I should s say that um, uh, earlier I made a comment that uh, the only known uh, version of bosonic string theory um, formulated, you know, as a level of perturbation theory through a Walsh CFT uh, that's, you know, free of tachyon has well-defined perturbation theory is the C equals one string theory. However, it does not mean that the C equals one string theory is the only perturbative string in two dimensions. In fact, uh, it's well known that, for example, 2D QCD uh, with either fundamental or adjoint quark is a string theory, it has a weak couple of strings um, that are dynamical excitations. And we actually do not know its worksheet theory formulated on the same footing as the C equals one string theory. So that will be a very interesting question. Okay, so C equals one string the theory is by no means the only string theory in two dimensions with a two dimensional target space, but it's the only one with a known worksheet CFT formulation. Anyway, um, okay, so um, the class, let's consider the classical equation of motion for the linear Dilettante theory, right? Um, uh, in conformal gauge. Uh, so again, we keep, take GAB to be eta AB, right? And uh, then it's obvious that uh, the equation of motion for X naught and phi are just that of free fields. So we have a free field equation for X naught, free field equation um, for phi. Um, so, so far, nothing depends on the background charge. However, that's not a complete set of equation for the classical string theory uh, because, uh, but we have to also, we have to include the Virasoro constraints, which in conformal gauge states that T plus plus and T minus minus are equal to zero. There's also T plus minus, which in this case actually is given by conformal anomaly, but let me not worry about that for now. Um, 
so, um, uh, okay, uh, well, uh, so what is this? Uh, these constraints, uh, these are, uh, you know, uh, well known. So um, in terms of this uh, fields, they are plus, let's say P plus plus is minus partial plus X naught squared plus partial plus phi squared. Uh, now you have a correction due to the background charge of the near dilaton, like so. And likewise, for T minus minus, you have a similar equation with the plus replaced by minus. Okay. Um, well, let's look at the solution. So now this, you see this background charge term actually has the effect on the, on the dynamics. Um, so if you look at the solution uh, uh, for X naught, it would look like some left moving wave and the right moving wave where sigma plus and sigma minus are light-like coordinates on the world sheet. Um, and uh, I can, uh, you know, assuming the typical solution, the F and G are non-degenerate, I can replace this F just by sigma plus, uh, replace this G by just sigma minus by coordinate def redefinition of sigma plus and sigma minus. Uh, okay, so the X naught is just sigma plus plus sigma minus. Uh, and then phi is also a, the sum of some uh, right moving part and left moving part. Uh, and uh, from this equation, we see that uh, they obey the equation, uh, you know, minus one, the first term partial plus or partial minus X naught, that's just equal to one now uh, by my choice of coordinates. Uh, so phi plus minus, Prime squared minus Q by plus minus double prime equals zero. Okay, so you can solve the equation and you find the solution. Phi is equal to phi naught minus Q log cosh sigma plus minus some constant over Q and a similar term with uh, sigma minus. So that's the most general solution. Okay, so what does the solution look like? Make a plot. Uh, so here's sigma and phi at a given time. You know, this, this log cosh looks like um, something like, like this, and another thing like this, and they're moving. And the total profile is the sum of the two. So it looks like something like this, right? Uh, and it kind of moves up and down in time. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so that's already kind of interesting because what it tells us uh, is something kind of funny. So the string um, can kind of turn around um, Actually, so I, I've actually kept track of the sign here. So it can turn around uh, at some maximal value of phi, some phi max. So remember phi is this spatial direction that has a linear dilaton back on charge. And um, when you do, if you do string perturbation theory, the string coupling will grow exponentially with phi effectively. Uh, so large phi corresponds to strong coupling region. And uh, so this is kind of gonna be region of strong coupling. Uh, and this will be region of weak coupling. Uh, so the string can kind of turn around at some point, you know, uh, uh, where the coupling becomes strong, um, but it cannot turn around uh, at some weak coupling point. So, um, you know, if you try to make it periodic in sigma, uh, like, like so, um, it's problematic. The solution is singular here. It doesn't solve the equation of motion. Uh, so uh, that seems to suggest the string uh, cannot close. Okay. Um, so in fact, the conclusion of this discussion is that uh, there is no oscillating closed string solution, at least at a classical level in the linear Dilaton theory. However, there's this string that kind of extends infinitely and turns, turn, turns around. This is called the so-called long string. We're gonna return to the subject of the long string in the last lecture. It will have some significant physical importance. Uh, but for now, the lesson is that uh, there's actually no oscillating closed string. Okay, so that's a bit funny. In fact, you could wonder whether there are any uh, closed string excitation at all. Um, so to so, answer that so question, we have to carefully uh, study the quantum theory. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, what, so I'm trying to understand the, the plot here. What's the gray uh, line? Uh, oh, <laughs> the, the gray line just corresponds to uh, the two, the, the, this part and this part. I'm just plotting oh, log of cosh uh, minus. Okay, I see. Okay, that looks like okay. this. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, the conclusion is funny. So, so there's no uh, oscillating, uh, oscillating uh, closed uh, string uh, solution. Okay, that's that's a bit funny. Uh, so what's going on? Well, we have to uh, to really inspect this. We, you know, we can imagine that okay, maybe the string cannot closed string cannot stretch, but maybe it can shrink to a point, and that's actually the case. So, um, but to understand the point like closed string, 
And this classical equation is not, no longer useful. Uh, it becomes singular and we have to look at the quantum theory. So we have to look at the full quantum CFD. Um, so at the level of the actual quantum CFD, then it uh, turns out the linear dilaton theory uh, is uh, uh, pathological. It doesn't obey the properties we would like to have uh, consistent CFT. Um, so, so why is that? Uh, well, um, uh, you know, if you read Polchinski chapter two or something, you would learn this as the first example of a CFT. So you might uh, wonder, well, how come I say that it's not a CFT? Well, you'll see. Um, so we would want um, uh, vertex operators uh, of uh, real weight. Um, if you write the vertex operator of the exponential form, e to the alpha phi, uh, uh, normal uh, ordered as usual, um, then for the Lyotard Le 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 theory, it's well known, this exercise in Polchinski, well, it's, it's discussed early on in Polchinski, uh, that uh, you have to have a vertex operator that looks like this. Um, um, uh, where, um, well, in fact, uh, for my purpose, uh, you know, C equals 25, uh, uh, you know, CFT, uh, Q would be equal to two, and the weight of this operator is going to be, uh, I'm, I'm working in alpha prime equals to one convention for now. Uh, so the weight is going to be one plus uh, P, P squared for this. Uh, uh, so it's uh, H tilde. Um, okay, so you want this, uh, this P, this parameter P to be real, for the weight to be real. Um, well, I guess you can also take it to be purely imaginary. Uh, we'll come to that uh, in a moment. Um, uh, well, it will turn out that these are the kind of operators you would like uh, if you want operators to be uh, delta function normalizable. Okay, if you take P to be uh, purely imaginary, uh, first of all, not only the weight is not bounded from below, uh, but these operators will also be badly uh, uh, non-normalizable. Now you might worry that there's this, you know, e to the, there's still this Q term, but we'll see that this actually does not uh, affect the normalizability. Uh, it's, it's not obvious from the discussion at, at the moment, but we'll see this in, in a second. Uh, in any case, um, these are the operators we'd like to um, include, um, but if you want to take P to be real, um, uh, you, you know, uh, such uh, operators uh, do not, um, uh, actually, I also want this way to be greater than go to one, uh, as, as I've kind of motivated earlier, because you want the theory to be, um, you know, tachyon free. And for that purpose, uh, you know, if P is real, then the weight is greater than or equal to one because of this uh, relation. The weight is one plus P squared. I've chosen my convention. So, so that looks like this. Um, anyway, uh, the problem is that uh, such vertex operators, um, obviously, if you just treat these as, uh, you know, free fields and take their OPE, uh, such operators do not close under OPE. Right, the, the exponents are additive and that's, they, they do not close on their own. Um, uh, okay, so that's already bad. Um, but furthermore, uh, furthermore, uh, we expect the effective string coupling to go like e to the q phi uh, from due to the spectrum charge term in the, uh, in the, in the action. Um, but uh, there is no, no preferred, um, preferred, uh, location, say, um, in phi. Uh, that means that, uh, you know, actually there is no uh, unambiguous notion of the coupling for this background. So uh, cannot, uh, actually it turns out, I mean, you know, the consequence of this is just that we cannot actually define um, string perturbation theory because uh, there's no well-defined string coupling constant to expand um, okay, so um, anyway, the point is that uh, if you use the linear data town background uh, with center charge 25, that does not define a sensible perturbative string theory in the two-dimensional target space with X naught and phi. Um, okay, uh, so uh, the, this problem can be fixed uh, by considering uh, Louisville theory instead of linear data town theory. So consider Louisville uh, instead of uh, of uh, linear dilaton. Uh, uh, 
Okay, so um, I'm gonna omit the x naught x zero part of the action. I'll just write the Liouville part. Uh, so this is um, a level of the action. You'd write this as uh, the uh, kind of the boson phi, um, still with the background charge term, uh, but now with also a, a Liouville potential term. It looks like this. Um, um, at least very naively, if you uh, view this as a deformation of the linear Dilaton action, uh, you would like to uh, you would like this operator, uh, even though it's not normalizable, but as a deformation of the, of the action, that's okay. Um, uh, you would like it to be marginal, uh, and for that uh, to be marginal, you want to uh, uh, it's necessary to take Q to be um, b plus one over b. Um, so. Um, because C is, the system is one plus six Q squared. Uh, you want to take C to be 25 and that corresponds to taking uh, B going to one. Um, so a word of caution is that um, uh, the semi-classical limit uh, of, the, of the action corresponds to B going to zero. Okay, that, that's the limit in which you can uh, a level of the 2D quantum field theory can treat this Liouville theory as a perturbed quantum field theory. Um, so B going to one uh, is uh, finite, uh, finitely away from that. And there's a certain sense in which the B equal to one Liouville theory is strongly coupled. Okay, so uh, you have to uh, take a semi-classical intuition with a grain of salt. Um, Anyway, uh, is, uh, but nevertheless, it's a well-established fact that uh, this is a CFT uh, at the non-perturbative level. Uh, there are many ways to understand this. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, there's going to be a, a state operator mapping uh, between, as usual, between uh, states, uh, or between operators inserted at the point on the complex plane, um, uh, let's say call this the Z plane, to the uh, cylinder. Uh, to a state on the cylinder, um, and we call this the coordinate W on the cylinder. Um, so, um, um, uh, let me just describe this in the following way. Uh, so if you take a field, take this field phi on the cylinder, right? So uh, let's say this is at, um, you know, time tau equals zero. Uh, so at tau, tau equals zero, uh, we can um, expand this field at tau equals zero um, uh, in this FOIA mode, sum over n, phi n e to the n i sigma. Um, okay, and uh, we can write, uh, describe a state in terms of this wave functional uh, um, as a functional of, the, uh, of all the FOIA modes. Um, we're just gonna, for now, uh, focus on the uh, dependence on the zero mode focus on uh, phi zero. Um, so um, uh, if you look at the, so you can just take the Hamiltonian on the cylinder, uh, you know, which is a functional of the phi n's, the FOIA modes, and just expand and look at the zero mode part. Uh, for the zero mode part, uh, you know, the, there's this potential uh, V of phi, uh, which is just this you know, mu e to the, to be phi. Um, it's this exponential potential. Um, so uh, the wave function, a state on the cylinder is a wave function uh, in this zero mode of phi. Uh, let's ignore the non-zero modes for, for the moment. Um, there's a limit in which this, uh, you know, description is, is, uh, is valid. Um, then, um, you know, uh, wave functions of, uh, you know, state, quantum states of the theory on a cylinder uh, with the definite energy are gonna be scattering states. They look like some wave that come in and some wave that reflect out. So these are kind of plane waves in the asymptotic region where the you know, phi goes to uh, minus infinity. They look like, um, look like plane waves. Okay, so we can say that uh, uh, you know, such a state, um, no matter what kind of complicated interaction it goes on in this uh, region where the potential is turned on, asymptotically, it has to look like the superposition of incoming wave with some momentum P an outgoing wave, minus p, um, and with some reflection phase. So this is some uh, reflection phase. Uh, 
OK? Um, so th that's the state. Um, that's a generic uh, scattering state. Uh, now, under the state operator mapping, it corresponds to some operator. So this corresponds to uh, some uh, vertex operator that's inserted uh, over here at, the, at origin on the, on the Z plane. Um, this vertex operator, I call it V, uh, labeled by the momentum P, this Luva momentum P. That's the same as the momentum of this, uh, 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 this plane wave in the field space. Um, OK, so what does it look like? Uh, While well, you have to think a little bit, you might think that you just take this vertex operator. Well, first of all, that would only make sense um, in the asymptotic region anyway, because um, if phi is finite value, then this uh, theory is interacting and you, you can no longer, you know, it's, it could be strongly interacting. Okay, you can no longer trust this kind of uh, pretty field description of the vertex operator. Um, but in the asymptotic region, phi goes to minus infinity, uh, you can still use this description. Um, and you might think that this vertex operator just e to the two to ip phi, uh, but you have to remember that that kind of operator would actually not have real um, energy or conformal weight. Uh, in fact, the correct operator is the one I wrote down earlier, e to the q plus two ip phi plus uh, the reflection phase e to the q minus two ip phi. Um, now, uh, so here's a good exercise for for the students. Um, so if you you can check this by taking the OP of a probe field uh, with the, uh, you know, with this uh, vertex operator at the origin, just in, in the linear detail theory, which is valid in the five goes to minus infinity limit where the potential turns off and compare it with the cylinder. You have to use the anomalous transformation property of phi uh, with a linear detail background charge to check that um, this vertex operator is actually the one that corresponds to the state on the cylinder. Okay. Um, but it's anyway, it's easy to see that they have the same energy, in fact. Uh, any questions about this? Now, the claim is that these are actually uh, the complete set of uh, states that are Virasoro primaries in the Liouville theory. Okay, all the states in Liouville theory are linear combinations of these plane wave kind of scattering states uh, uh, and their Virasoro descendants. Um, so um, now, uh, in the CFT language, we'd like to study the coercion functions of these operators. Um, so uh, the way I've written it is not quite normalized in a canonical way. So to normalize, uh, we'd like to uh, set the two-point function of VP, let's say zero, VP prime and one on the plane uh, to go like up to some normalization uh, convention, delta function in P minus P prime. We'd like them to be delta function normalizable as we can do for this kind of scattering states. Um, so uh, for this purpose, uh, we would like to treat the incoming wave and outgoing wave on equal footing. So we're going to um, uh, redefine. So maybe I call this VP tilde. So redefine um, uh, the phase uh, such that uh, VP, um, as in the phi goes to minus infinity limit, goes like SP to the minus a half, the incoming wave. Uh, plus sp to the plus a half, the outgoing wave. Okay, so now the incoming and outgoing wave are treated on equal footing. And that's going to be my convention that defines this vertex operator VP. So VP is the vertex operating oper Liouville theory defined unambiguously by the property that in the asymptotic region, it looks like this. Okay, um, okay so now, um, to uh, specify the CFT data, we need to know the three-point function, VP1, VP2, VP3. Uh, as usual, we can place this at 0, 1, and infinity suitably rescaled. Uh, so this is uh, not usually called the structure constant. It's a function of P1, P2, P3. Um, okay. um, now, uh, I haven't been very careful with the overall normalization convention, but that actually can actually be absorbed into uh, a rescaling of the, this uh, mu parameter, which is also called the Liouville uh, cosmological constant that was mentioned earlier, this, this mu parameter here. Anyway, um, okay. Um, so um, now, uh, uh, one of the reason that, um, you know, the sequence one string theory, as some of you might have heard, 
is an old subject. It was, uh, it was studied uh, way back in the early 90s. And the subject gets revived again and again. And there are still kind of you know, things that in the old literature that are being cleared up. And the reason for this, uh, which is historical, um, is that um, you know, when this theory was proposed, uh, people did not know uh, what are these sort of constants. Okay? Um, and that was solved uh, in the work of um, Dorn and um, Otto and uh, Zamolodzikov, Zamolodzikov uh, squared, um, uh, a few years later, around 94, 95. Um, uh, oops, sorry. Can uh, I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so, you know, for that, you know, phi goes to minus infinity as in part of the vertex operator. So, uh, what if phi uh, so becomes so possibly large? How does the uh, vertex well, operator uh, then look I like don't know, But I don't need to know because the claim is that if you know the asymptotics, it specifies the operator. You see, um, when you view this as a scattering problem, this is a scattering uh, wave function, um, uh, you know, if you describe the wave function of this thing on a cylinder, okay? Uh, so, when we, when we have a scattering problem, we specify the quantum states by specifying the asymptotics. The actual scattering sure, sure. process can be very complicated, but we can label the state unambiguously uh, by saying what is the asymptotic wave function. Sure, but it's just see, I suppose one is curious how they look I, like. I, so, well, look, so what uh, do you expect? I haven't solved the theory for you yet. I'm only I've only told you so far a way to label unambiguously all the states of theory. Nothing more than that. I agree, but I suppose I was curious how- I'm going to, I'm going to now uh, dis discuss how to actually solve the theory. Okay, so, so here's a quick trigger. So does it sort of to go to zero at some point? At, uh, that's not- really large uh, Well, okay. Uh, so, okay. Um, uh, look, uh, when I write the vertex operator in this form, this only meaningful, uh, you know, if the theory is free or weakly coupled. The theory what we're going to discuss is not weakly coupled. This, it's not meaningful to write even e to the alpha phi as a vertex operator if you are away from the weak coupling region. Well, that vertex operator surely is some functional of the field phi. So it's a well-defined functional. I mean, it may uh, be it's hard a to compute. Of, um, uh, you can describe the wave functional on a cylinder uh, as a function of all of these FOIA modes. Uh, generally, that could be very complicated, and it, will, it is very complicated. Right, but I'm just saying. I don't need to know that information to solve the CFT. Okay. All right. Right, right. So, 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 okay. I just want to repeat my question so that maybe at some point you want to come back to it, which is suppose I just want to know what is the, I mean, what is the quality uh, of the would not, uh, I will never uh, need to use the explicit form of the wave functional again because all the CFT data are going to be captured by the three point functions. So, once I know three point functions, I can solve everything. I need to calculate. I don't need to know the explicit form of the wave function. In fact, the whole point of the CFT technique is it allows you to uh, you know, solve the physical observables of interest, namely all the current functions, without ever having to worry, worry about the explicit form of the wave function of a state. No objection of that. OK, thanks. Yeah. OK, any other questions? Um, OK, so um, now. There are, you know, different ways to, to get to this. Um, um, I think it's, you know, uh, uh, those of you who have seen the explicit result for the DOZZ formula for this sort of constants, they're very complicated. Uh, I'll say a little bit about what they look like, um, but I think it's more important to say uh, where this um, uh, formula comes from. Um, now, the original papers have some convoluted trick that used to derive this formula. I'm going to explain a kind of a streamlined uh, derivation of this, just to sketch the idea, uh, usually often goes under the name of a uh, Teschner trick. Uh, the point, the reason I want to explain this is because I want to explain what are the assumptions that go into this. Um, so um, the first assumption is that we need to assume that uh, the structure constant um, is um, an analytic function in the PIs. That you can add continue this to a function on the complex momentum plane. Uh, this function could have poles, but it's generically analytic. That's an assumption. Um, if, you, if, you, if this is true, uh, it allows you to uh, then continue, uh, say, p, um, one of these momenta p to a special value, complex value, that I call it p to 1. Um, this is um, a, the value of the momentum, some complex value, such that h, which is uh, the weight, 1 plus p squared, 
uh, becomes um, uh, this value H21, which is a weight uh, for a very sort of primary uh, such that you will have a null descendant at level two. Okay, so in particular, um, uh, this combination, L minus one squared plus B squared L minus two, uh, V P to one uh, is null. <clears throat> okay, it has zero norm. That's a, that's a standard story in representation theory of the various sort of algebra. Um, but now we'll have to make the second key assumption, key assumption um, is that there's a sense in which if you do this in a continuation, this null state is actually zero in the sense that it's, a, it's actually the zero state. Uh, and if, if you insert this into any quotient function, um, uh, that quotient function will vanish. Now, uh, I want to emphasize that this is not obvious because we are analytically continuing uh, the momentum. So we're no longer in the theory. This operator does not actually exist in the spectrum of, of the theory, okay? So even though the theory is expected to be unitary, you cannot say that this null state has to be zero because we don't really know what we're talking about. So this is the assumption. Uh, however, this assumption will lead to a solution to the sort of constant that you can then check that obey all the consistent conditions of conformal bootstrap. That's gonna be the logic. Um, okay. Um, by the way, this, this kind of assumption will fail in some other examples of CFT with continuous spectrum. So I want to warn you that it's not a given. Um, so if that's true, then uh, it follows that there are uh, differential equations uh, for uh, four point functions like VP1, VP2, uh, VP3 for generic P1, P2, P3, and then VP21, just by inserting this uh, versorial descendant operator on this last guy here. It's a standard exercise, as you can. Uh, this was, I think, explained in some chapter of Pochinsky. Um, um, so this differential question is some kind of uh, hypergeometric, hypergeometric uh, equation with solution under two f one functions. Um, okay, so um, uh, so this uh, equation has some consequences. Uh, this is standard conformal bootstrap manipulation. So, for example, it tells you that this OPE between uh, v uh, p two one and v p three would only contain operators like v p three plus minus i b over two, um, and uh, together with the uh, crossing uh, invariance of the four point function, uh, will uh, lead to uh, allow you to fix the ratio um, between uh, c p one p two p three plus i b over two, and uh, um, three minus IB over two. Um, okay, and, and you can also uh, 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 similar, uh, similarly for uh, uh, B going to one over B, uh, if you uh, use uh, this is a VP12 instead of P21. Anyway, um, it's, a, it's a standard story. Um, uh, the um, uh, so uh, so the, these ratios will give you some kind of you know uh, recursion formula that relates uh, these uh, strike constants at different values, and you can find a solution up to some normal, overall normalization that has some suitably uh, reasonable and and properties, you know, asymptotic properties on the complex momentum plane. Um, so that's that's the, the, the that's the that's the rough logic. Okay, the, the details formula are very complicated. It's you know not something I will explain in these lectures. But uh, but you can find this in standard uh, references. If uh, anyone wants to know the references, you can uh, I can give, provide that uh, after the after the lecture. Um, so there's one thing I want to comment on is that um, uh, so earlier there was a question about the, the form of the wave function. So I didn't explain, for example, what the re reflection phase is. So you might wonder what is this. Well, well, what is this S of P? Can you determine this? Um, and that's actually kind of kind of important. Um, so even though that's, that's the data doesn't directly enter um, the the CFT data, the three point functions. Um, so um, uh, so let me just say that um, overall uh, normalization normalization. Um, uh, together with this uh, and, and this phase uh, can be fixed um, by 
uh, so-called resonance computation. Um, uh, let me explain this. Oh, by the way, there, I think there's a question about whether the other um, values of uh, degenerate versus or primaries are useful here. Um, uh, the answer is that, uh, the, the, anyway, the short answer is that I don't actually need them um, to, uh, to, de to de determine this. But uh, I believe that uh, if you play that game, you will uh, get a result that are consistent with the, um, uh, with the DOZZ formula. Anyway, um, so, um, the resonance computation. So, okay. So, uh, if you take the this this thing and then continue um, to the following. So, uh, let's take q over two plus i um, p one plus p two plus p three. Uh, this combination I call it epsilon. Let's take the limit. This going to zero by some end continuation. Um, the claim is that this thing has a pole. We'll go like one over epsilon times something. Um, so, why is that? Um, well, it, it's just true, actually, if you, you can look at the formula you saw by these recursion relations. Um, but uh, there's a nice explanation. So, so this uh, quantity is actually equal to, in this limit, it can be calculated just by um, the zero mode part of the path integral. Um, so you're going to have uh, some background charge insertion. Um, and, uh, and then you just insert uh, you know, these uh, vertex operators in the asymptotic region. It looks like, uh, looks like this. Uh, or J from one to three, um, uh, you know, the, the point is that this, um, in this limit, the contribution to a three-point function is actually dominated by the asymptotic region. Um, you can just do this integral uh, uh, up to some cutoff. Uh, let's say uh, here's the V of phi, here's phi, and let's say when the potential is roughly of order one, let's call this phi cutoff. Okay, so just, um, just integrate up to this phi cutoff. Um, Okay, if, if you do this integral, uh, I, I won't bother doing this integral already right here, uh, you'll find that, um, uh, so, um, you know, that's why I chose this epsilon here. So you, if you look at exponents, um, in the uh, limit when this epsilon parameter goes to zero, that's when the exponent vanishes. So that this integral will be dominated by uh, the asymptotic region, it goes like uh, one over epsilon uh, mu to some, uh, some power, it's not so important. Uh, then uh, you, you're left with these phases. Okay, so if you have already solved this optimization from the DOZZ uh, or Teschner trick, uh, then by taking this resonance limit, you can read off these reflection phases. Um, so this fixes uh, the, the re re reflection phase S of P. Uh, I'll just tell you the answer. So S of P turns out to be equal to uh, minus some gamma function. Uh, ratio gamma function um, squared. Okay, so this is the Liouville reflection phase. This is the exact formula. Um, by the way, uh, as a terminology, historically, uh, this s to the one half is called uh, the so-called leg pole factor. It has some interesting interpretation and historically also caused a great deal of confusions. Um, uh, I will not discuss the confusion at the moment. But it's just a just a terminology. If you see this in the old literature, um, okay. So um, uh, let me uh, uh, at least give you uh, the uh, so the three point function uh, c p one p two p three. I said it can be determined by this recursion formula. I'm going to write down what it looks like um, because I'm going to use some of these properties uh, in a moment. So um, the solution of normalization turned out to be uh, some function uh, upsilon one. Uh, these are the so-called Barnes double gamma functions. I will not actually define it precisely. I will, um, uh, um, but I will describe uh, its properties. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, it's a. Uh, uh, this is uh, in the uh, you know B equals one case. Um, uh, times uh, cyclic permutation, oh, well, just you know, cyclic permutation. Two other two other terms. Uh, that's it. Uh, where uh, this upsilon one of x is uh, so called uh, Barnes double gamma function. Um, 
it is an entire analytic function uh, on the complex x uh, complex x plane uh, with um, uh, zeros at uh, integer values that are not equal to one. Some of these zeros are of uh, multiplicity. Um, that's all uh, I will say about these functions for the moment. Mm, and uh, uh, one important property, which is not, you have to use the property of the function, which I haven't told you, but you can check that these are actually uh, all real. So these are real uh, for uh, PI real. Uh, so that's good because that's required by unitarity. Okay, actually, if you look at the original DOZZ paper, uh, the short contents are not real, but that's because they use a different convention for the vertex operators, which are not canonically normalized. If once you normalize a two point function, uh, these things are real. Okay, uh, th that's all I'm, all I'm gonna say about Louisville CFT. Now back to string theory. Um, so uh, the physical string states Uh, are described, these are asymptotic states, single string asymptotic states are described by vertex operators uh, labeled by their energy um, uh, with either in or out, which are labeled by plus or minus as a superscript. Um, and they look like uh, some string coupling or normalization e to the plus minus i omega x naught uh, vp. Um, and for this thing to be on shell, I need to take p to be omega over two so that this whole thing has a uh, weight uh, one comma one. So recall that I'm working alpha prime equal to one convention so that uh, you can check that this will have weight one. Okay. Um, and uh, so uh, again, as an intuition, so now in space time, we've got this Lugo direction with this potential that somehow should repel the string and we've got the time direction. Um, so, uh, uh, phi is a spatial direction, but it's not a translation invariant. There's this potential. Uh, and here we have strong coupling. Um, and uh, on the left, we have weak coupling. Now, um, earlier I said that if you had a linear dilaton theory, there's no well defined coupling. But now with the dual theory, you have. The reason for this is because um, uh, you know, the strings are kind of, you know, pushed away from the strong coupling region. So let's say you can look at the place where the potential is of order one. Uh, anyway, this is a pretty drawn picture. Uh, it's maybe it's too confusing. Let me erase that. Um, there's a place where, um, let's say, uh, potential is of order one. Um, and, uh, um, and you can look at the coupling, the string coupling at, at this location and use that to define uh, the overall coupling constant of your theory you know, of the string background. Okay, so uh, you know the, the picture is that you know the, the strings should uh, come in from the weak coupling region where the potential is flat, uh, and then interact and then get bounced back from the uh, strong coupling region uh, and come back out to the left. Okay, so uh, when I say a physical string state, uh, this vertex operator really just describes either in or out asymptotic state that corresponds to a particle coming in from the left, um, and uh, in the asymptotic region. Uh, you, you see that these things actually look like they have a um, relativistic dispersion relation uh, of that of a massless particle because the momentum is proportional to the energy. So that looks like a massless particle. Okay, so, so asymptotically, uh, we have massless particles. And just one species of them because this is the only, it turns out this, these are the only vertex operators you can write down that are delta function normalizable and represent non-trivial BRC cohomology. Um, so um, earlier I said that there are no oscillating closed strings in this theory, but there are point-like strings, which are these things that behave like massless particles in the asymptotic region. Um, now uh, note that um, if I write the one particle state associated with this vertex operator, it will turn out that the normalization is um, slightly non-standard, it goes like omega delta function in omega, in the energy omega. Um, well, this is not obvious from, from, from what I've written so far, but it can be verified if you look at scattering amplitudes. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, so um, let me just say in words that this is in contrast to 
um, some other kind of vertex operators people have discussed in the, in the literature in, on, in this context, uh, which have um, imaginary new momentum P, uh, they are not normalizable. Those vertex operators um, do not correspond to physical excitations of the theory, rather they can be added to the action as deformation of the theory. But due to the lack of time, I'm not gonna discuss that in detail. Um, so uh, now I want to discuss um, scattering amplitudes. Um, um, you know, after all, the, that's basically the main object of interest in stream perturbation theory. And I'm sure many of you uh, were disappointed uh, when reading Polchinski that when it's time to compute a loop amplitude of string theory, it turned out to be divergent. Um, but here we can compute loop amplitudes and they're perfectly finite and are non-trivial as we'll discuss. Um, so the simplest one is a tree level three point amplitude. Uh, so you have some, let's say incoming and outgoing, I'll just label them by plus and minus with some energy omega, omega one, omega two. Okay, so what is this? Well, um, you can calculate. Uh, so uh, let me just to you know, specify the convention, let me say that uh, for example, if I consider um, a one to N uh, S matrix element, uh, it's gonna be labeled by the energy of incoming particle omega and outgoing particle omega one, omega two, all the way to omega N. Uh, uh, well, anyway, I guess the order is a bit wrong, but it doesn't matter. Um, uh, so this gonna look, is gonna look like a delta function, uh, omega minus uh, the sum of this omega i's from one to n uh, times the amplitude, which is called a one to n, a function of omega one through omega n. Um, okay, so that, that's just the, the convention for the, what I mean by the amplitude. Sometimes uh, one writes this a as i times amplitude. I just want to be clear about the convention here. Um, so uh, unitarity in particular implies that um, if we have unitarity, uh, hopefully, um, uh, that, uh, you know, for example, um, if you sum up all the one to n amplitude, the total probability should be equal to one. So in, in terms of formula, that means that, uh, uh, you know, these um, things, uh, if you uh, integrate uh, in the omega i's, uh, subject to the constraint that sum of omega i equals omega, uh, this is supposed to be equal to one. Um, but I'm using a convention for the in and out states uh, with this funny normalization. So with this normalization, I have to uh, take, that in, take that into account uh, by dividing by omega, omega one to, the, to omega n, just to normalize the asymptotic states. So this will be the formula for the unitarity relation, at least as far as the uh, one to n part, uh, amplitude is concerned. Okay, we'll come back to this. Um, so whatever amplitude you want to compute, hopefully will obey this relation. Uh, and of course, as usual, this, this uh, amplitude is gonna admit a expansion in the string coupling constant, perturbatively. Okay, now uh, let's come back to this, uh, 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 th th this guy here, uh, the third point. Um, so, um, uh, so this is very simple. Um, uh, you know, this, uh, so I'm gonna label, so one to two, tree level amplitude, I'll call this, this is a tree level, uh, label by zero, zero to order. Um, uh, it will turn out to be just equal to I times the string coupling uh, times the uh, three point function coefficient um, because the, the sort of the matter part is, you know, it's kind of trivial once you, uh, uh, you know, fix the location vertex operators to be zero, one infinity on the complex plane and go through the usual exercise. Um, you just get this uh, structure constant, C P1, P2, P3, um, but uh, remember P was omega over two in my convention. So this is a C of omega uh, over two, omega one over two, omega two over two. Okay, so anyway, the three point amplitude at tree level is just a string coupling constant times the DOZZ structure constant, very simple. You might say that, okay, but this looks like a mess because the DOZZ formula was very complicated. It involves all these uh, oops and functions that are so complicated that I didn't even write them down. Um, okay, they're very complicated. Um, okay, however, um, there's a miracle. So uh, the miracle uh, is that 
if omega is equal to omega one plus omega two, which is the case here, uh, it simplifies. Uh, and the square constant becomes uh, simply omega, omega one, omega two. So this is something you can verify using the properties of the uh, um, um, of these uh, Barnes double gamma functions. Okay, so the claim is that the trivial of one to two amplitude is i g string times uh, this uh, simple polynomial expression. Um, okay. Um, so uh, next, let me uh, let's see. Uh, le next, let me discuss uh, the one to uh, the four point amplitude. Uh, we can talk about either one two three or two two two. Uh, let me start with this one two three, which is a little simpler to to discuss. So we have some omega, the omega one, omega two, omega three. Um, so if you use the usual. Um, Okay, so how do you compute this? Well, uh, if you use the usual um, uh, prescription, so unitarity condition. I'm sorry. What happened to unitarity condition for three point function? Uh, well, uh, 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 you are asking what is the implication of yeah. this? Um, uh, this. Uh, well, uh, this uh, you can uh, convince yourself actually that um, uh, it is not constrained. Uh, by that relation, as long as the C is real. Okay, because I'm only writing down the tree level contribution. The unitary relation is for the full all order amplitude. Okay, okay. so uh, what it's gonna do is that uh, if you know this one to this tree level amplitude, it's gonna constrain the one loop amplitude through the unitary cut. We'll come, come to that in a moment. Okay, so unitary relation is gonna constrain uh, the one loop one to one amplitude in terms of this tree level one to two amplitude. All right, thank you. Um, okay, uh, so let's look at the one, two, three. So this uh, is uh, when it becomes a bit uh, complicated um, and uh, uh, interesting. So um, in the usual way of calculating things, uh, string amplitude, uh, you can fix three vertex operator integrated over the fourth one. This is a standard exercise in Polchinski, um, just like in the derivation of the Verasoro Shapiro amplitude. Um, so we have the integration over the moduli of the cross ratio Z uh, and then uh, some free field correlator from the x naught sector, uh, which will give you z to the uh, absolute value to the omega omega one and uh, one minus z uh, omega omega two. Uh, but then you have a non-trivial part, which is the luvial correlation function uh, v omega over two uh, z uh, v omega one over two at uh, zero v omega two over two at one and v omega three over two at infinity. That's uh, suitably rescaled. This is the four point function in Liouville theory. Okay. Um, now, this four point function in Liouville theory is very, very complicated. Um, there's no, uh, this guy, uh, there's no, uh, you know, elementary formula for this. Uh, the only way we know how to calculate it is uh, using the definition of um, um, uh, the four point function, uh, you know, by decomposing. Uh, you know, insert complete basis of states and relate this to the three-point functions. And uh, uh, so this four-point function in the CFT, as uh, well known now, uh, can be expressed as an integral, well, usually a sum, but in this case, an integral over conformal blocks. So um, it's an integral over some intermediate primary labeled by the mom momentum P from zero to infinity, um, uh, the structure constant C omega, uh, say in one of the channels, let's say uh, uh, the Z go to zero channel, um, C uh, um, omega two, omega three over two P um, times uh, uh, the conformal times the Virasoro conformal block uh, with the, which is you know just labeled by the uh, uh, the weights of the internal label primary and the external. Uh, 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 the external uh, alluvial vertex operator. Um, I guess in picture, we usually draw the picture like this. So here we've got omega, uh, this, v, one over two. So we're looking at this channel. <coughs> okay. Um, so um, uh, let's see. 
Um, so I'd like to make a few comments about this. Uh, mm, let's see what I want to say first. Mm. So a priori, if you um, look at this function, uh, the Arsoro component block is a function of z, um, you might uh, run into uh, singularities. So, so if you look at this, actually, it looks like uh, z to the, if you expand in z, uh, it looks like z to minus 2, uh, some power. Uh, I, I guess I, I, I meant this, the full integrand. So, um, uh, no, actually, I, I think, uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm in the full integrand. Looks like uh, uh, this. You can you can check. It looks like this times some series expansion. Uh, let's say n m integer grand equal to zero. Some co coefficient um, like that. Um, so if you just you know integrate this in z uh, for generic energy, uh, you have uh, divergences uh, around z equals zero. Uh, but that's you know, but you know this conform block expansion is good around z equals zero. If you look at z equals one, there's potentially some other singularity you'd like to. You can, that, that's kind of visible if you ex do the conform block expansion in the other channel. So this S and T and U channel conform block ex expansion. So um, to define this as usual, I think uh, some aspect of this was actually explained in Ashok's lecture. Uh, you need to regularize. Um, well, there are different ways to treat this, but uh, one way to treat it is that you can regularize the z integral uh, by uh, subtracting uh, of uh, power divergences uh, in uh, S and T and U channel, respectively. Uh, let's see, there's a question. Uh, should P be determined by the fusion rules? Uh, well, the fusion rule allow all values of P. Okay, so so this is actually a continuous integral, and they all contribute. The the fusion rule here does not spe, you know select any special value of p. That's why the Fulbright function is complicated. This is not like a minimal model or something like that. Uh, not not a rational theory. Uh, theory. <clears throat> okay, um, uh, so the divergence near is equals zero, one, or infinity. Um, so it turns out that when you subtract this power divergence, that would maintain suitable analyticity property of the amplitude in the energies. So, the, uh, so uh, this way of regularizing the amplitude, the result um, is uh, analytic provided that imaginary part of omega minus omega i is not zero. It turns out this you can, it's possible to verify, but I won't uh, discuss this in uh, too much detail. Um, Okay, so um, uh, now uh, it's useful to think about, uh, oh, as always in the context of S matrix, to think about uh, analytic continuation of amplitude in the energy or the momentum. In this case, you know, they're basically the same thing. Um, uh, in fact, historically, before the DLZZ formula was available, people have attempted to determine this amplitude by studying its analytic continuation. Uh, this procedure um, is called the resonance computation in the context of you know, Liouville theory. Um, sometimes it worked, sometimes it did not work, and led to some confusion in the early literature. So I would like to uh, say a few words about uh, what is going on here. Um, so if you do this p-integral, so this p-integral is over uh, the positive real axis, but you can actually can double it into an integral along the entire real line, so this is on the complex p-plane. Um, we you continue, you have to be a little careful about uh, the singularities in the integrand. So it turns out that um, there are infinite families of poles uh, on the complex p-plane that depend on, uh, uh, depend on the uh, energy of the external states. So if you look at this formula, uh, the structure constant, the uh, p-integrand, um, has poles uh, from uh, you know the DOZZ formula uh, at uh, p equals alpha plus i n, where n is an integer, and um, alpha is equal to uh, plus minus omega plus minus omega one over two, and plus minus omega two plus minus omega three over two. You know, remember, we're talking about uh, the conform block decomposition in the uh, 
uh, in S channel where omega, omega one go to omega two, omega three. Um, okay. So, um, for example, uh, if you consider uh, analytic continuation, and we can really continue, con continue um, omega, which is the same as omega one plus omega two plus omega three in this example, uh, to some value like two i, then uh, the poles at uh, p equals omega plus omega one over two minus i, and uh, p equals uh, minus omega plus omega one over two plus i, uh, they will collide and pinch the contour. So uh, in picture, it looks like, looks like this. Um, uh, so there'll be a, a pair of poles that will pinch the contour. Uh, in fact, you know, generally they could go somewhere off the real axis and the contour has to move along in order to maintain analyticity. Otherwise, if the pole cross the contour, there'll be a jump. Uh, so you, you have to deform the contour as this pole moves around in order to maintain an analyticity. Um, so in this example, it turns out that um, uh, the, uh, the P integral uh, reduces to uh, a single point, single point, i.e. a single conformal block contribution. Uh, and this conformal block turned out to be co coinciding with the linear data time four-point function, uh, and the result is very simple. So this is known as the resonance computation. Um, and in this case, in this special case, uh, you can show, you can, you know, based on the argument I've given here, you can show that the amplitude can be and can continue to, to this value of energy omega, and at this point you can do a simple computation. Um, I have to warn you that this doesn't always work. In some other situation, um, it could be, uh, I'll just say this in words, I think. Um, uh, actually, you know what, uh, maybe I should, I should write this down because it's kind of a, it's kind of a confusing issue. So uh, in contrast, um, if I consider uh, this uh, two to two amplitude, which is a kind of similar computation, um, if I continue this to omega one plus omega two, which is equal to omega three plus omega four. Uh, so here's our omega one, omega two, omega three, omega four. Um, this go to two i. It turns out that you also have a situation where there are a pair of poles that kind of pinch the pinch the contour. This is the p contour. Um, but in this case. Um, it turns out that in this limit, uh, the Liouville uh, correlator uh, diverges. Um, uh, at the location where this, uh, um, uh, uh, well, in, in this limit, um, but uh, it turns out the divergent part the, the divergence, the divergent part uh, as a function of z, if you integrate in z, the cross ratio, uh, that integrates to zero. So actually you have a zero times infinity uh, situation. Um, and the result is that actually the result um, is actually finite. Result is finite, uh, uh, but it does not reduce to, does not uh, reduce to, um, to a single uh, conformal block. Okay, so uh, the, the point of this is that it's a warning that, you know, uh, just because uh, you can continue this momentum such that the pair of poles pinch the contour doesn't necessarily mean that the result reduces to, to just a contribution from a one point along the P contour. Uh, generically, you know, the entire contour will, con will contribute. Um, okay, uh, anyway, so uh, this computation, um, you know, can be done numerically. And so I said this formal function is very complicated, uh, but, uh, but we, we have efficient and numerical technique to calculate all these various sort of component blocks uh, thanks to uh, work of Zamologikov uh, in the late 80s. Uh, so using this Zamologikov recursion formula, we can numerically very efficiently calculate um, these conformal blocks uh, for generic values of the cross ratio. 
we can then numerically integrate these against, so multiply these component blocks by the DOZZ story constants, which are very complicated functions, but numerically it's not a problem to calculate them. We numerically integrate in the momentum P in the cross ratio Z, taking into account of this subtraction. Okay, so this uh, takes a little bit of work, but it can be done uh, to high accuracy, in fact, uh, at least five digits of accuracy. Um, so, um, and the result uh, turns out to be, uh, well, the result, result is numerical, but it agrees with an expectation that I haven't explained. Um, so it turns out that uh, this tree level one to three amplitude, despite that I've so far I've described a very complicated calculation, the result is actually a very simple function of these energies. It's I times coupling squared, uh, omega one, omega two, omega three. Oh, did I make a mistake? I think I... Uh, uh, I think it's omega times this. I think I made a mistake in my in my notes. Uh, omega times this um, times uh, one plus i omega. Uh, that's it. Okay. So uh, uh, this is uh, let's say checked, uh, check uh, checked against um, the worksheet. Uh, uh, numerically to high accuracy. Okay, uh, so that seems to be a bit of a magic. And uh, how do I know this formula is true? Uh, this is was conjectured uh, from the matrix model duo, which I'll discuss in the second lecture. Um, and uh, I still don't do not know a, a full derivation of this from the worksheet perspective. I think it should be possible, um, but. Um, you know, if you carefully keep track of all the possible resonance contribution, but, but you know, it requires a somewhat sophisticated analysis um, of all the, all the, how the, all the poles move. Now I should say that uh, perhaps um, it's not entirely fair to say that there's no derivation of this because in the early, early literature, people have actually guessed this answer from the world sheet using the resonance computation. But back then um, it was really just a guess because there was no understanding of the expected analytic structure of how these um, Liouville correlators behave uh, as you know, continue in the momentum. But with the, with, with the understanding of this component block uh, expansion, uh, that can be kept track of uh, carefully. Um, okay. Um, uh, let me make a few comments about, um, uh, about these, uh, these, these amplitudes. Um, so, um, there's a kind of a crossing relation, uh, a level in the sense of uh, S matrix. Um, so uh, you might wonder uh, whether uh, the two to two amplitude, say um, you know, omega one, omega two, uh, going to omega three, omega four, uh, could be related to um, the one to three amplitude, uh, omega one going to minus omega two, omega three, omega four, uh, by some kind of crossing relation. Um, and it turns out that there is such a relation if you put the minus sign in front and it follows from um, the, a curious fact that um, these DOT distorted constants as a function of these liberal momenta, the way I defined it, uh, these p's are uh, real and positive, and then negative, and this, um, by definition. Okay, so that defines the spectrum because this p just labels the incoming wave of this scattering wave function. Um, however, uh, these are analytic functions in the momenta, so nobody can prevent me from analytic continuing p to minus p. So if you continue, uh, so continue analytically to minus p, uh, it turns out that this is actually equal to c of p1, p2, uh, p3. Okay, so thanks to this uh, amusing fact, uh, which, uh, you know, is kind of curious, um, uh, from the worship point of view, there should be a crossing relation relating, say, 1 to 3 to 2 to 2 amplitude. Um, but um, there's some kind of subtlety about this. 
So, um, so from the worksheet, uh, we can do this continuation. So can continue omega two to minus omega two um, using the same you know, definition of the worksheet amplitude. Uh, the result will be anal analytic in the momenta in, in the energy, uh, provided that um, the imagined part of, say, some combination omega one plus omega two, imagined part of omega one minus omega three, imagined part of omega one minus omega four, uh, do not cross zero. Um, so, uh, and if you do this, you will conclude that there's a two to two uh, tree level amplitude, uh, which is the form. Uh, I g squared omega one omega two omega three omega four um, times uh, one plus I times um, I would call this uh, some quantity I call this the I max of uh, omega i's. Uh, this stands for the omega i uh, with a largest uh, imaginary part. Okay, so that's the result you'll find. Um, but that's a bit uh, uh, strange because uh, this is not well defined for real omega i. And so that looks like a problem. Um, and in fact, um, it, you know, uh, we verified this numerically uh, in our paper in 2017, um, uh, directly for the 2 2 amplitude. Uh, and that was a, was a bit puzzling. And, uh, uh, at the time, uh, we thought that uh, you know the interpretation of this is due to some kind of infrared subtlety with the uh, uh, C equals one string theory, uh, because we're talking about you know scattering of uh, asymptotic particles that are uh, massless. Now, if you have massless particles in one plus one dimension, um, you know the wave packets are all moving at speed of light. So, unlike in higher dimension, or unlike scattering massive particles where wave packets eventually separate in the far past or in the far future, um, for masses part in one plus one D, the wave packets do not separate. So you might worry whether there can be some subtlety in the definition of asymptotic states. Uh, and in fact, if you assign some imaginary part to these energies, um, uh, it will suggest that maybe the asymptotic states would be ordered by the imaginary part of the energy. That basically indicates you know, which state is created uh, first. Um, but ultimately, I think um, that doesn't seem to be uh, quite correct, because uh, if you want amplitude to, to be uh, fully unitary, it turns out that, um, as far as I know, you know, one actually cannot make sense of this IMAX prescription, even if you allow the states to be, um, asymptotic states to be, to be ordered. Um, and in the literature in the early 90s, it was a different formula was proposed um, where this I max is replaced simply by max. Um, so it appears that that's actually the correct formula for the two to two amplitude. So this issue does not enter in the one to n amplitude, but does occur for you know two to n scattering. Um, uh, so in an interesting way, so this looks kind of uh, bizarre. In fact, um, uh, you know, even with this, you know, so the formula is like is like this for the tree level two to amplitude is explicitly not analyt analytic uh, in the in energy it, it jumps um, so um, so far I don't actually have a clear understanding of the origin of this from the worksheet point of view uh, but uh, presumably uh, the way to uh, to understand this is that there is a uh, prescription for how to end the continue uh, the worksheet amplitude a priori computed for you know, complex uh, you know, momentum or, or energy as often in string perturbation theory and you have to be careful with the domain of end the continuation uh, there's some way to end the continue you know that's answer into into this one um, uh, but it's interesting that you can actually check I I explicitly that this thing obeys unitarity um, so for example if you write a to be uh, I times T, uh, the usual optical theorem would be, let's say two times the imagined part of T, uh, say one to the two amplitude is gonna be the integral of uh, T two to one, T one to two, 
as well as T223, uh, 322 at tree level. So uh, the omega over omega, where omega labels in one of the energies in intermediate states. So um, uh, for example, uh, you know, the right-hand side corresponds to unitary cuts like this, or cuts like uh, this, uh, or cuts like this. Um, so uh, maybe just as a as a you know simple example, uh, let's say uh, we take omega three to be the max of all the omegas, um, and then you can see that the possible uh, cuts on the right hand side uh, correspond to you know one two one two three four like so, and uh, one two uh, three four. Uh, one, two, uh, three, four, uh, where this intermediate energy is omega one plus omega two. This intermediate energy is, uh, let's see, omega three uh, minus omega two. And this intermediate energy is uh, omega three minus omega one for this intermediate particle, all right? Um, and uh, I guess I'll leave it as an exercise for the students to, to verify that, uh, uh, that this thing actually holds uh, using the simple formula I gave you. So, you know, I, I, I told you what the three-point amplitude was um, for, for, you know, all, all of this, or just some simple product of energies. And I also told you this four-point amplitude is given by this max expression. Um, uh, and, uh, and you can check that this thing, uh, this entire relation actually obeys. Okay, uh, any questions about this? Um, I think uh, maybe I will just uh, end with a comment. Um, okay, so uh, what I told you so far is that uh, you can calculate this one to three amplitude from the worksheet uh, using the first formula I gave you, seemed to give you a very nice answer. Uh, that as well show you in the second lecture, we'll agree with a uh, pr proposal from a dual matrix model. Uh, now this two to two amplitude, which is supposed to be related by crossing, there's some funny subtlety in, um, in the domain of analyticity. Uh, and uh, uh, the naive prescription from the world sheets actually give you an answer that seems to be in conflict with the unitarity. And one has to modify that to this uh, expression involving the max of the energy. And uh, as of now, I do not know of a, um, a, priori, a priori explanation of this from the world sheets. So if someone come, comes up with un, a better understanding of this, I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be happy to know. Um, but, uh, but that's our understanding of this um, tree level amplitude so far. Um, now, uh, it's more fun and more, it's harder, but more fun to compute the one loop amplitude um, like so. So the first non-trivial amplitude is a one-to-one -one reflection amplitude, which is already non-trivial at one loop order. Um, so I won't have time to, uh, uh, really explain this in, in well okay let me just draw some pictures uh, so we can represent this torus in this way so this is a really this is a really non-trivial string amplitude computation uh, like so and um, so you have the two points on the torus where the vertex operators are inserted the plus and minus uh, separated by z so this amplitude at genus one is uh, uh, well so you have to integrate over the fundamental domain of the torus uh, modulus tau you have to integrate in the coordinate z, which is on the torus, parameterized by tau. You have to now compute the torus two-point function of Liouville theory, uh, which again has to be calculated by uh, conformal block decomposition. Now uh, we're talking about torus two-point conformal blocks. So pictorially, I'll represent this by integral dp dp prime of uh, the torus conformal block associated with this channel. We call this the OPE channel. Uh, this is also equivalent to another alternative decomposition, which we call the necklace channel, uh, like so. Um, so these torus component blocks are, you know, um, defined in the usual way. The, the, all the Virasoro component blocks are defined. Um, uh, they can be calculated efficiently again numerically. So this can be um, these torus Virasoro component blocks. Uh, can be computed uh, using uh, recursion formula. 
generalizing the logical formula. So this was uh, done in the paper I wrote with uh, Minjie Cho and Scott Collier uh, back in 2017. Um, I'll just give you the archive number. If you want to look at the look at the detail of this computation, it, it's fairly uh, complicated, but it can be implemented on the computer. There's no problem. And um, um, there's some subtlety again having to do with the regularization of the amplitude. So it turns out that uh, you know you have to be careful about um, uh, elasticity, the domain of elasticity. Um, you have to uh, because you know for it turns out that for real energy, this integral in tau and z actually diverges. So you have to start with some imaginary value of energy omega, and then and continue to the real energy. But when you do the same continuation, you have to worry about the possibility of that these integrands, which come with the DOZZ structure constants associated with these vertices, um, they uh, could have poles in P or P prime or P1, P2. And this, this P momentum integrated along the you know, real contour, you have to make sure that when you do that continuation, the poles that do not cross the contour. Okay, so there's a lot to worry about in this computation. Uh, but it turns out that after you, you know, be careful about that, uh, you can compute this um, um, numerically at least for, so compute uh, numerically, uh, uh, at least it's straightforward for imaginary part of omega. So for omega uh, imaginary, for imaginary part of omega between zero and one, like I mentioned. So that's the domain in which no, none of the posts cross the contour. Otherwise you have to take in kind of some additional residue computation, which is a bit more complicated. Um, and uh, so the result agrees with, um, with the formula with a formula for the one of amplitude, which is again, a simple polynomial expression, i g squared over 24 uh, omega squared plus two omega to the fourth plus i omega to the fifth. Um, this formula once again is a conjecture from the matrix model, which I discussed in the second lecture, um, but this is uh, uh, checked against this worksheet computation, which is actually a very, very hard numerical integral to do. Uh, that has to be around the cluster. Uh, um, um, and uh, the result agrees within 1% of uh, accuracy to the extent we can tell. So it seems to be in agreement. Um, but I haven't told you where this comes from. Let me just end by saying that this last piece, which is what we call the imagined part of amplitude, you know, which is the, 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 the T amplitude is minus I times A. So the imagined part of T is the real part of A. Uh, this is the last term here. So this actually is fixed. Um, by unitarity um, via the cut like, like this. Um, so once again, I will leave this as an exercise for the students. This is, takes five minutes to do, if you know what's going on, or, or even less. Um, uh, so you can, you can verify that uh, using this unitarity relation I wrote down earlier, early on in the, in the lecture, um, you can check that this, this last term in this one loop uh, amplitude formula is actually fixed in terms of the tree level one to two amplitude by unitarity. Um, but uh, these, uh, this, uh, this, this real part of amplitude uh, or the imagined part of A um, is a phase. Well, it's, it's like kind of, kind of like a phase uh, correction. Uh, so this is a, a new prediction uh, of a one loop worksheet calculation that's not a priori fixed by unitarity. Um, so uh, I guess I'm out of time. So I will uh, stop here for the part on string perturbation theory for the C plus one string. Okay, thanks C for a very nice lecture. Uh, any questions for C? So what's the string coupling constant? Where did it come from? Oh, uh, well, the string coupling constant come from uh, how you uh, compute any string amplitude. Uh, there's a, a normalization. Uh, you know, in, in your amplitudes. Uh, so, you know, uh, this, is, uh, this is textbook stuff. So uh, if you follow the prescription, say in Polchinski, so every vertex operator comes from with some normalization and then there's normalization factor associated with the topology of the sphere or the torus. Um, and you have to fix that, uh, the relative normalization by unitarity cut relation. Um, and then it will always leave, you know, one um, ambiguous or you know, overall uh, coupling constant associated with the three point vertex, which you can define to be the string coupling. So uh, once I specify the normalization, say for the three-point amplitude, uh, it fixes all the normalization uh, via unitarity relations. Okay. This is like in any string perturbation theory. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, uh, so maybe I, I, should, uh, I should mention that intuitively you can think of the string coupling that, 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 that shows up here as uh, the value of the, it's given by the value of the delta um, at where the level potential is of order one. So I have a question about the formula for the two to two scattering. Yeah. And uh, you have this max formula. The max means uh, the maximum of the real part. Uh, just the, the, the maximum of omega one, omega two, omega three, omega four, all of which are real and positive. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's obviously if you want to continue, then uh, it's, not, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not quite analytic when the real part cross one another. When the real part, you know, one, the, you know, of one is bigger than the other. So your previous formula is the maximum of an imaginary part. So That's how right. these two consistent with each other? So uh, your previous they formula, are not the same formula. Uh, uh -huh. So uh, all I can tell you is that um, this uh, I max formula is what you would get from the Rauchy computation if you use a naive regularization. That is, you subtract all the power divergences. Uh, so I think the conclusion I would draw from this is that to get the actually physical correct um, uh, amplitude of uh, uh, that's expected from the biomatrix model, uh, that prescription is not quite correct. Uh, it's correct uh, provided you do some uh, suitable and continuation. Yeah, because th these things are, if you start from the correct, if you start from some domain of the complex energy space uh, and just and continue, you will arrive at the formula. But uh, uh, it's not a priori obvious how to uh, how to choose the do domain of an electricity. It's kind of up to you, because uh, you know, um, as always in stream perturbation theory, uh, the worksheet integral we write down, uh, you know, unless you use you know Ashok's approach, you know, stream field theory approach, a priori in in this kind of worksheet approach, um, we you always run into um, a priori divergent integrals for physical energy, um, and you have to decide on. Um, how to end and continue. But in order to say how to end and continue, uh, you need to know your expectation of the energy property of the scattering amplitude you want to compute. Okay. So now in Minkowski and space time, uh, we have expectation. For example, it's well known that for the full point amplitude, we expect, expect some sort of Mendel stem ellipticity. Um, so we can continue from regions where we can trust the Warshi computation and then just do a continuation. Um, but in this case, we're talking about a theory of as some particles start scattering in one plus one D without Lorentz invariance. Um, so it's not a priori obvious uh, what the expected analytic property of amplitude would be. So if you start from the Walshi computation with some complex energy uh, and then continue, you have to kind of sort of know what is the domain of electricity you expect to begin with. Um, and um, yeah, so, so as far as two to two amplitude is concerned, I don't have a, um, uh, a satisfying understanding of what the general prescription is. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that the, the naive prescription give you almost the right answer, but not quite. Okay, thanks. So any more questions for C? So this is probably just about repeating what you have already said, but I probably didn't follow everything. So the calculation is really like um, a combination of two insights. One is the asymptotic behavior of say the scattering states. The other is um, some knowledge about the exact CIT representation of say the null states. And then you somehow combine them together with the assumption of analyticity and then you're able to figure out everything. Is that sort of, uh, you know, yeah, I, I guess I maybe I should just comment. Uh, thanks for the question. Actually, I, I should comment on why uh, this thing wasn't done earlier. Uh, so much of this discussion was actually in my paper with uh, uh, Bruno Balthazar and Victor Rodriguez, which we wrote in 2017, uh, which uh, was, you know, like uh, almost three decades after the initial work um, of the subject on sequel to one string theory. Um, uh, now, um, uh, 
you know, even the honest, you know, calculation of the Walsh tree level four point function, four point amplitude wasn't really done until our paper. Um, uh, uh, so, so why did it take so long? Um, well, uh, you see, uh, so the three-point function, okay, so first of all, historically, you know, much of these papers were in the early 90s were written before DOZZ. So the solution to liberal theory was not known and people had to cheat a little bit using linear dilatum, but it's not quite right. Uh, so, you know, um, um, now with DOZZ, in principle, this computation would have been possible if you are able to um, calculate such as something like this liberal four-point function, but these things are, uh, horrible uh, functions. Okay, so even though I claim that the result of the true amplitude is very simple, some polynomial expression in the energy, that's some kind of miracle after you do the z integral. Before the z, in z integral, this liberal form function is some horrendous mess. Um, and the only way we're able to calculate it is to use uh, Zamologikov's re recursion relation to calculate the conform blocks numerically. Uh, now, the, the Zamologikov recursion relation was was known since the early since the late 80s, um, but I think I think that you know the string theory community didn't catch up on it uh, until uh, much later. Uh, you know, people basically you know did not really absorb this recursion formula until uh, uh, you know uh, the work on uh, conformal blocks. Uh, sorry, the work on conformal bootstrap in you know in the 2000s. Um, so, and uh, then you know we're fami fami now familiar with this tool and looking back. Uh, is was really quite a straightforward numerical computation, even though uh, it's numerically actually still quite tough, but but as, at least it's possible to do in principle, um, and it allow, allow us to uh, calculate things like this, uh, you know, one loop, one to one amplitude, uh, which was uh, really not possible using this kind of resonance uh, guesses that people uh, made in the early 90s. Um, so, but I should say that for this one loop computation, for example, uh, we do need these uh, recently obtained recursion formula for the conform blocks on the torus, um, by the way, which also was generalized to all genus. Um, so, so that was a new input. So uh, without, without this recursion formula for the torus conform block, it would not have been possible to even numerically calculate uh, this uh, one, one loop one-to-one -one amplitude, for example. Yes. Now, once again, you know, the result in this case is actually quite simple. So perhaps someone more clever will invent some uh, nice trick to obtain an analytic answer. But up to now, uh, there's no such trick is known uh, from the worksheet uh, perspective. Uh, okay, I see there's some questions uh, in chat. Uh, sorry, I haven't uh, you see that earlier. Oh, these questions were asked uh, a while ago. Uh, let me see. Uh, so there's a question of uh, why it's called a resonance computation. Um, it's because, um, uh, well, um, you know, maybe let me not get into, get into this terminology, but, uh, uh as I explained uh, earlier in some specific example, um, you know, it's uh, special values of any continued energy, uh, at which the contribution localized to contribution from a single conform block. So it's kind of, uh, Anyway, um, and let's see, there's another question. Uh, there's a question about the situation related to the discrete term contribution. Uh, I'm not sure what, what is meant by discrete terms here. Um, yeah, I see the question from Sung Hua, but I didn't understand what, 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 what is meant by a discrete term in the, in the question. Sorry, I can't. Uh, it's just means uh, that the, the conform block you sum over the all the you just integral over all the momentum, and uh, some once you once you internal internal vertex have a equal conform weight, and uh, there are some some point uh, up to some point in the conform block they have the the structure constant the square c square the d u z z. Uh, C square will have the double pole here. So that, in that sense, the 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 this, uh, the, the conform block will have have double pole here. So it 
it should be reduced to the single, uh, just a single confirmed broker. Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, actually in some examples, the full story has become more complicated. Um, let, let me emphasize that again, because I think the discussion maybe was a little confusing. Um, so uh, there are two qualitatively different situations uh, when you are continuing in the, in the energies here. Um, in one situation, um, you have a pair of post pinching the contour um, such that um, if you look at the integrand, which is the component block multiplied by the structure constant, mostly the structure constant is, is the, the one that's playing a role here. Um, it's such that the contribution from the rest of the P contour uh, is goes to zero. And contribution, but there's, there's some kind of delta function contribution localized at the point where the uh, poles pinch the contour. So that's one thing that can happen. There's something else that can happen in a different kind of you know, situation where uh, formally it also looks like a pair of post pinched contour, um, but uh, the contribution from the rest contour do not vanish, whereas contribution from this pinching point diverges. So in this in this situation, um, the um, so that, that's what I'm trying to explain here. In this situation, um, the uh, if you look at the Liouville four point function um, in this in this limit, it's just divergent. Okay, so Liouville four, four, four point is divergent. But the four point amplitude, the string amplitude is actually finite. Why is it finite? It's because the divergent part of the four point amplitude, sorry, the divergent part of the Liouville four point function, when you integrate against the cross ratio, you actually get zero. If you regularize the, that the Z integral. Okay, so, um, uh, so it's a funny uh, zero times infinity issue. So you have an integrand, uh, uh, you know, the Z integral, the moduli space integrand, which is the Liouville four point function, that itself diverges. But the, the leading divergence somehow integrates to zero when you integrate against a cross ratio. So uh, in this case, actually, um, the result does not collapse to a single component block contribution. So you have to be careful. And this point was actually missed in the early literature in the 90s, which caused some confusion. 